Well, you ready to move on? Yes, sir. All right. Well, I'm going to introduce to you our next uh, special guest on this Thursday. Nicholas Shalin is his name. Let me tell you a little something about him, and I've got uh, quite a bio here, so please uh, stand by, but listen to all that he has been involved with over the years. Highly qualified expert, appointed as the first Air Force Chief Software Officer under Dr. William Roper, the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition, Technology, and Logistics in Arlington, Virginia, but also the co-lead for the Department of Defense Enterprise DevSecOps Initiative with the Department of Defense Chief Information Officer. Now, as the Air Force's senior software czar, Mr. Shalin was responsible for enabling Air Force programs in the transition to Agile and DevSecOps to establish force-wide DevSecOps capabilities and best practices, including continuous authority to operate processes and faster streamlined technology adoption. Now, as he goes on, the chief software officer works with the program executive officers and is also responsible for analyzing current software and cloud migration plans to avoid vendor lock-ins while allowing for rapid prototyping and streamlined process for deployment. Now, to keep with the pace of technology, Mr. Shalin elevates and uh, evaluates and uh, authorizes new commercially available off-the-shelf software and cloud-related technologies. This is to help with their adoption across various Air Force programs based on whatever the, the mission need might be. Prior to his current position, Mr. Shalin was a special advisor for cloud security and DevSecOps at the Department of Defense, OSD, a ANS, and special advisor for cybersecurity and chief architect for cyber.gov at the Department of Homeland Security. Yes, indeed, a busy man. He designed the new robust, innovative, and holistic .gov cybersecurity architecture, cyber.gov, that mitigates cyber threats by leveraging best practices and implementable solutions with minimal impact to workforce efficiencies. And as we move on, in addition to his public service, Mr. Shalin is a technology entrepreneur, software developer, cyber expert, and inventor. He has close to 20 years of domestic and international experience with strong technical and subject matter expertise in cybersecurity, software development, product innovation, governance, risk management, and compliance. Specifically, these fields include cloud computing, cybersecurity, DevSecOps, big data, multi-touch mobile, IoT, mixed reality, virtual reality, and wearables. And the list goes on and on and on. Mr. Shalin is recognized as one of France's youngest entrepreneurs after founding Work uh, World Act at 15 years. That's right, 15 years of age. That's right, he was a teenager. He has founded 12 companies, including Aftermouse.com, Cyber Revolution, Prevent Breach, AnyGuest.com, among others. And over the last eight years alone, he created and sold over 180 innovative software products to 45 Fortune 500 companies. Additionally, on top of that, he is recognized as a pioneer of the computer language PHP. Mr. Shalin is a sought after advisor and certainly speaker, including participation in multiple industry conferences and experience working in close collaborations with uh, many Fortune 100 companies and our own US government. So ladies and gentlemen, after that uh, lengthy introduction, with a smile on his face, did I get it all right? <laughs> I did to welcome Nicholas Shalin. Did we get it? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Next time, I promise I will give you a shorter version of this. That well, was, let me tell uh, you, it's long. most impressive. Let me say that. that. That's pretty good stuff, David. Absolutely. And, I, and Nicholas, I think it was really important that we go ahead and give people an understanding of the depth and breadth of your experience. Because the conversation I want to have with you today, of course, is about how your experience as the chief so uh, software officer for the Air Force and the Space Force, and that you're now a private citizen. And, uh, and of course, you're in the news. You've been speaking quite a bit uh, lately, et cetera, <laughs> about something that I think is very, very important. And I think people need to understand your bona fides. The depth and breadth of your experience is really important. Um, and I'm a fan of um, outspoken people who uh, say what needs to be said. Um, I, I would quote Busey's law that says nothing of importance was accomplished by a reasonable man. <laughs> and, uh, and so I am a fan. I am a fan of what you've been doing for our country. I'm a fan of what you've done in, 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 in industry, et cetera. But I, and, and, and really wanted to have you come visit a little bit about your experience with our, our government. 
um, your views on China, where we are, how we're competing and all that. Love for you to talk a little bit about the work you did and then your decision to uh, go into the private sector and some of the things you've been talking about, the, the wake up call that you've been giving uh, America, uh, where it's at and, and what it needs to do to stay competitive. So I'd love for you to chat a little bit about that. Absolutely, yeah. Well, you know, I think it was pretty exciting to see that a small group of people can really make uh, change happen in the department. You know, we were able to move uh, the Air Force and Space Force closer to, uh, you know, Agile and DevSecOps and bring, um, you know, all these capabilities on space systems, jets, bombers. You know, we demonstrated we could put a, a very advanced cyber stack with zero trust and uh, a big team security and uh, uh, you know, Cubase and containers all into the U2 jet in 12 days on legacy hardware and uh, be able to fly the jet, uh, bring AI ML capabilities to manage the sensors of the jet. Also that uh, we can uh, demonstrate over the air updates without any impact to the airworthiness of the aircraft. Uh, so we proved again and again that uh, all this is possible. It's possible on legacy systems. It is possible to move at a pace of relevance in the US government. Um, unfortunately, uh, what we were not seeing is a sense of urgency, particularly when it comes to China. You know, we, we like to call them the near peer adversary, but I completely disagree with that. I would argue they're leading uh, actually in cybersecurity and uh, also in AI ML adoption, uh, mostly thanks to their ability to mandate their companies to work with them. Um, but at the same time, you know, we see um, the U.S. government becoming complacent uh, and getting used to uh, China catching up. And, you know, we should be leading so far ahead with, with the, the, the amount of money we're spending. And again, I, I argue we spend a lot of money, but we probably get a 10 cent, 10 cent return on investment on the dollar when you compare the cost of doing business on the commercial side. You know, when I, when I started coming in with, uh, you know, 20 years as an entrepreneur, I was pretty good at you know, estimating uh, cost of work. And uh, very quickly I realized, wait a minute, you know, what would cost 50K on the commercial side would cost half a million and, and so on, right? And so you realize pretty quick that not only uh, by not adopting Agile and really still leveraging uh, Waterfall, uh, which does not enable us whatsoever to compete, um, and you compound that to the nightmare of the acquisition uh, process in DoD and also the silos and egos getting in the way of, of common sense sometimes, you end up having a, a very poor return on investment ratio, uh, which lead to you know China catching up. And if you compare to a Tesla, that's completely fine open sourcing their patents because they're moving so fast that they know by the time you know their competitors even remotely catch up, uh, they're going to be five miles ahead. Um, so they have no fear of, of competition. We should be exactly in that role. Well said. Um, this is this is what I think America, not just our government, uh, needs to hear. America needs to stop being complacent. We need to stop telling ourselves that we're way ahead and someday they'll catch us. So you might talk a little bit about where they're ahead. There are specific things that they have caught us on and that they're ahead on. And of course, they have natural uh, uh, advantages. They have more people and they have more STEM educated people and they have more people focused on these issues. And you've spoken a lot about how their, uh, their businesses, uh, that they are able to command their businesses to participate and, and, get, and get as much out of the private sector. So if you could talk a little bit about some of those advantages they have and some of the things we need to do to be able to compete, that would be very interesting. Yeah, and of course, we don't want to lose the American values, right? There's a reason why I moved to the U.S., where we all believe in the American dream. And, and we're not saying, hey, we need to start um, stopping um, all the privacy law and uh, ethics, right? Uh, at the same time, what I've seen in, in, the, in the DOD, uh, particularly in the Joint AI Center program, is a lot of people coming from industry uh, being in these roles, in the government roles for, for two or three years that are quite honestly anti-military. And I would hear them say, you know, we should not have AI weapons um, they would spend most of the budget in uh, ethics engagements, uh, writing more and more reports, uh, knowing that you know, we're not going to come to um, any kind of meaningful weapon capability using AI uh, because of, of those uh, principles. Um, I, I certainly agree there is a place for ethics. I'm not saying there's no room for ethics. But at the same time, uh, we need to have the deterrence aspect. We need to obviously be... Um, um, proactively engaging and competing against, you know, uh, 
uh, China uh, in a meaningful way. And it cannot just be, you know, on the business side, we see companies like Google walking away from projects like Maven uh, that were effectively uh, helping us do better at, at, at vision and targeting, which potentially could have prevented, you know, the debacle we've seen in Afghanistan where, uh, you know, seven kids died because we targeted the wrong target. AI could have prevented this. You know, AI is capable of uh, having a better understanding of real-time uh, vision detection at scale, something that humans would never be able to do at any kind of scale. So, you know, back to uh, the advantage, of course, you talked about 1.5 billion people. Uh, on paper, you know, it's already tough to compete, right? Um, they're also drastically investing in, in their kids uh, very early on in cybersecurity, AI training, data science, and so on, hardworking people, you know, uh, they're not sleeping, waiting for us to figure this out. Uh, of course, they have the advantage um, of mandating their companies to work with them and get access to all this data. You know, there was a great hearing again on TikTok and the fact that TikTok is obviously uh, being used as an intelligence weapon by China to capture all the US data and what you see in the background, what you're talking about. Uh, access, tremendous access to the data on your phone. If you look at the privacy uh, uh, policy of the, the, the application, you're going to be very worried about letting your kids or anyone uh, for that matter in the United States using that application. Uh, that's designed on purpose to be viral and to spread and, and get as much access to data as possible. People dismiss it as, hey, that's not a big deal. They see what I'm doing. They see what I'm saying. Well, they see everything in the background when you're walking around, what books you're reading, what you're talking about. Uh, it's capturing massive amount of data on everybody. Uh, and on top of that, you see a very good adoption, you know, on the weapon side, you've seen also, again, uh, the announcement with the hypersonic launch of, of China, you know, again, allegedly, the US government being surprised, uh, I would certainly say that I was not surprised. And um, we should, again, stop being complacent, the more we keep using the term uh, near peer adversary, instead of just saying peer adversary, but by definition is compounding the problem is just making us uh, feel a, a lack of urgency. And you see all these reports coming out and saying, oh, you know, China is, is moving fast in AI and, and we, we have to wake up and China is targeting to be the AI dominant leader by 2030. Well, you know, they, they, are, they are doing that now and, and they're not waiting for us. And honestly, what people fail to realize in these reports is that when you start compounding the volume of data they get access to, you compound that to the velocity of delivery of these AI capability continuously in production, uh, using uh, agile and and being able to uh, continuously improve and augment you know these AI models through continuous learning. Um, at some point, you get to to a point where you just cannot physically even be able to catch up. Um, and so we estimate a December 2022 to be the deadline by which, if the U.S. government does not wake up, we will not have an ability to uh, catch up. And that means really uh, at this time, uh, a real existential threat uh, for our kids and the nation. Well, I appreciate your saying that. Um, and this, this December 2022 date is interesting because you have to think about what happens leading up to that. What, what is going to change that would enable us to, if that is a tipping point, what are we going to do differently now in order to prepare for that date? Because it's kind of like waking up in the morning and looking at your scale and wondering why you gained weight and not thinking about what you ate the night before, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and then also there's this denial. I don't. I can't see the scale because my tummy's in the way. <laughs> well, um, so you just ignore it. So we like to call them our near peers, right? Because that's somehow consoling and comforting. But you're, they're not. They are our adversary, and they are ahead of us. So I appreciate you saying that. So the specific things you've talked about agile. And a lot of people may not know what Agile is, right? I'm, a, I'm an OPEX Lean Six Sigma guy, right? So that, you know, that, that means something very important to me. Small batch, good. Big batch, bad. Yep. Iterative processes, et cetera. Feedback loops, all this sort of stuff. So if you could talk a about that, that'd be great. But also what we as a nation policy-wise, what do we have to do so that this December window, when it comes up in 2022, we haven't missed it. What yeah, do we have absolutely. to do? Yeah, no, that's always the most important piece for me to share is the, the solutions because talking about the problems is boring now. Um, so back to Agile, you know, the, the whole concept of Agile is the continu continuous small incremental delivery of value in production in a tangible way used by the actual end user warfighter in our case, 
where we can demonstrate that the ideas and the features we're building are not built in a vacuum, actually deliver the value intended. So we're not wasting time and money, but it's also small enough. So small batches. So you're not creating massive issues and uh, creating a situation where you're going to you're going to fall down and not be able to stand back up. That's the whole point of Agile is you don't do massive delivery where you have a tremendous risk of production uh, stability and high ability of your systems. Uh, you also want to be modular and flexible like Lego blocks so you can cut things and try things out and even release stuff in incremental fashion, uh, maybe to a subset of your users first, uh, all the way to 100% of your user base. And you want to do it fast, right? So it's, it's fast, more incremental delivery of value and that's uh, really what, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we, we, we are pushing. Unfortunately, you know, the, the, the U.S. Uh, government is doing a very poor job at training our leaders and honestly, the, the war fighters on agile. Uh, in fact, it is not mandated. I created, I helped create it with the Defense Acquisition University, um, the uh, agile training. And to this day, uh, what is mandated is waterfall, uh, earned value management of dated principles, and even when people come, you know, fresh out of school, excited about Agile, uh, they have to go through that, you know, um, completely um, useless training that's pushing the, the wrong behavior, the opposite of what we need, really. And, and they, they, they used to reach out to me and complain about it. And, and, and unfortunately, I've, I've yet to see, you know, um, the, the, the leadership at OSD ANS uh, mandate Agile training to everybody, including our leaders, uh, I've heard, you know, uh, the Joint AI Center director again a few, few days ago in response to my resignation say, hey, you know, we, we're going to deliver slow incremental uh, value. That, that's not what Agile is. Again, you know, the answer is it's not to do incremental um, delivery of value slowly, it's to do it fast. Um, that's the whole point. Uh, so again, you, you're just missing the point. Um, and we can blame these people. They are good people. They just don't know better, right? But but that's the point, though. We, we need to put the right people in charge. So back to the answers, I think there's two main pieces, right? The, the first one is to invest in our people and uh, get out of the way when you don't know what you're talking about and empower people down to the lowest level and Monday, the agile training and really uh, more than that, you know, invest in continuous learning. I was giving an hour a day to my people so they could learn and catch up with what's going on in the world. Um, so getting access to the lear learning hub we built with unbiased content in data science, AI, you know, DevSecOps, cloud, whatever, right? And you can continuously learn and make sure you're up to date. That's so foundational because, you know, AI and, and IT in general is moving so fast. We can become stale. And I was becoming stale too, you know, being stuck in this DoD bubble uh, of lack of velocity, right? And so that's the first piece is investing in people and mandating agile. And of course, mandating DevSecOps for new programs. We, we have yet to mandate even DevSecOps for new programs. That's kind of a disgrace. And then, you know, the second piece is creating some joint teams, uh, particularly on the all this redundant work and waste of taxpayer money we're, we're compounding across Navy, Army, and Air Force uh, programs. Uh, you've seen it with the joint um, all domain command and control program, JETC2, with ABMS, product convergence, and overmatch creating um, solutions in a vacuum where really we should join that. Uh, we should have um, direct report to, to DevSecDef. We should have um, a few key joint teams that are enabling everything else, right? The, the basics of IT life, I like to call it, from transport, you know, connectivity to cloud, to DevSecOps, to AI ML, to data fabric. We know we're talking about data, we're talking about AI and Congress is talking about creating, you know, career paths for AI in the government, but we don't have software talent. We don't have data fabric. We don't have a data like data warehouse. How are we going to do AI if we don't have the basic ingredients to get there, right? It's, you can't just build this in a vacuum. So we have to build that. We have to do it jointly. We need to bring talent from all the services so egos get out of the way and we stop trying to do things in vacuums. But we need to bring people, when I say talent, is is people that have the expertise and experience. That's the most important. You know, you don't just wake up and say, "Hey, you know what? You, you have a degree in 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 whatever, and you're gonna you're gonna do a, you're gonna build a cloud." Uh, for 4 million people that's going to be air gapped and age capable and, and and oh by the way you've never built a cloud before for a startup of 20 people that just makes no sense google would never hire that person they wouldn't even get an interview for the job right and yet we put these people in charge of the the largest engagement on the planet for ai ml and, and cloud and, and 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 zero trust people that have never even understood the zero trust principle you know in the uh, in dod 
I created the largest implementation in the US government for zero trust. I pushed zero trust five years ago at DHS, all to hear that it was too early. Uh, and, and, and I created the, the largest implementation in the Air Force and Space Force in the US government, all to hear uh, recently that DOD CIO is gonna create a, a complete new uh, zero trust stack from scratch, not reusing any of the work we've done in the Air Force and Space Force, um, just because they wanna go to a single prime where we were buying end-to-end -end agile capabilities, having the government as the integrator and a companies providing you know, uh, capabilities and talent. So we were never locked into a single company. The government was always the product owner, uh, grooming the backlog, prioritizing the work. That's where we wanna be. So <clears throat> thank you for giving solutions, right? Because a lot of these events that we have, et cetera, that a lot of people have, that you, they call it innovation theater, right? We say it's important, We've got to do something, but the how really matters, et cetera, right? So I appreciate um, you're actually giving, spelling out um, some ways to actually do this. But ultimately it gets down to culture in my mind and culture being what you value, what you care, mm -hmm. what you care about. And that is underpinned by compensation and reward theory. We pay people to do certain things. We reward them to do certain things. And one of them is to be risk averse. One is to do things the same old way. One is to not rock the boat, right? You, you don't get ahead by upsetting your boss or, you know, uh, you know, saying the, well, emperor the status has, quo, yeah. yeah, the status mm -hmm. quo, the emperor has no clothes. People don't want to hear that. So um, we have to change how we're incentivized, et cetera. And ultimately, this comes down to being an adult. Someone has to be an adult who says this is how things work, et cetera. I, I have to commend Microsoft, for example. Microsoft had 3000 employees and they signed a petition saying we don't want to do business with the military. We don't want to help our national security. Et cetera. And Microsoft leadership said, are you nuts? No, <laughs> we're going to do that. Okay. And if you have that mindset, someone has to, I'm sorry, say, appreciate your sentiment, you know, great, but we're here to win. And America does have enemies. So somebody has to be an adult. And I really appreciate you're having an adult, frank conversation with people. I hope perhaps that there, I don't want to see another commission, but I would love to see, you know, um, the military adopt a philosophy, a paper that integrates the things that you're talking about. How do we have everyone not be siloed? How do we have joint uh, command over all of these things? How do we reuse good investment and work, not, not start scratch because of how our acquisitions process works, mm -hmm. right? So um, if, there, if you have any, if, if I can make you king for a day, <laughs> I'd like to do that and solve this problem. And, and, and if you could, what do you think it's going to take in terms of leadership to actually wrestle with these things and wrestle them to the ground and actually come up with a plan so that December, 2022 doesn't pass. And we go, Oh yeah, they're ahead. We're never going to catch up. Yeah. I mean, you know, back to the comment on, on, you know, people have to be uh, the adults in the room. I would argue uh, kids sometimes will do a better job than what I've seen in the Pentagon. Uh, but, you know, I think there's a couple of reasons why, you know, people get away with all these issues is, um, and no one is held accountable, you know, people are saying right now, me talking and me going public to raise some of this awareness is me creating an oper operational security risk to the nation. Uh, allegedly, China is not even tracking what I'm saying, which is completely, obviously, uh, um, false. Um, and, and obviously, again, vastly under, underestimating what China can do in terms of intelligence. Uh, but it's really, at the end of the day, I think the real reason why people uh, think this way if they were taught about this OPSEC concept only to make sure that, hey, we're going to overclassify everything. So if we mess up, we're never held accountable, right? There's no one able to talk. There's never anything coming out. And so you get away with murder again and again. You know, I've seen programs waste billions of taxpayer money, fail again and again, multiple years in a row, and no action taken, and no one even knows about it. So the taxpayer can complain. No one even is tracking the waste. Well, what we see is, hey, you know, we're spending 750 billion of taxpayer money in defense. Most people with a brain understand that this is important and that we have enemies and we need to do that. But they assume it's spent wisely, right? They, they, they just think it's not just being wasted left and right. And, and you know, back to my 10 cent on the dollar uh, point, people would be pretty upset if they know, well, you know, really 75 billion are going to the right place. The rest is probably wasted that, that, you know, people will be upset about that. And the if fact that no one is, you know, no one is willing to do that 
um, is scary, right? And so the, the beauty with me, as you said, you know, I, I sold enough companies not to care about what people think. And so I'm able to do that, but not everyone can. And you know, back to your point, putting people in the right role, you know, uh, honestly, a DevSec dev kind of role, right, uh, would be um, a great option, right? That's where um, you end up, you know, in a situation where um, you have uh, the ability to fix all this stuff. And most of it is not policy, right? Most of it would be tangible outcomes. First, we have to stop having Congress mandating reports after reports. You know, this is not a report problem or policy problem. Um, you know, this is about um, effectively taking tangible actions. I talk about the joint teams, right? Direct report to DevSecDef, uh, very uh, uh, small incremental delivery of value in a tangible way um, with, you know, mandated tangible outcomes. Um, you know, I've seen, uh, unfortunately, people being put in these roles where they don't know enough about, about the subject matter. So they end up doing what they call the risk reduction efforts, right? They just invest in everything that sticks until they see what sticks, uh, all to do that for a year or two, um, wasting a tremendous amount of time and money. But, but if you, I would argue if you had the right person in the job, they don't need to do that because they have the expertise and experience to know what sticks, right? And I, I was like, well, you know, you don't need to do this because that just makes no sense. You know, you just want this, right? Um, and so I was able to help people to prioritize, but but it just takes some existing uh, awareness of what's going on. And, and I think the, the, the fact that we can also publicly share the threats with China, you know, you see companies like Google walking away and, and they reply back to my comment of walking away from Maven that they have a lot of DoD contracts. Well, sure, but you only doing business contracts. There's nothing on the weapon side because when I ask about, hey, do you want to do business with DoD on the weapon side? Uh, you know, Google was like, well, sure, as long as you follow the terms and conditions of our, our products and the terms and conditions are pretty clear. You know, they say, well, you know, you, uh, you cannot um, use products if they're going to harm people. Well, a weapon is designed at some point to, to arm the right people. Um, you know, and, and so again, that, that's just another way to say no. Right. Um, but they just won't say no. They just say you have to follow the time and conditions. Right. That's, you know, com compared to the Google, the Microsoft answer, that's not acceptable. But I, I think if people were able to know and track the risk and the threats and see what China is doing in a more tangible way, and if we stop overclassifying all that stuff and remove the how we got to know this stuff and just talk about the what, which shouldn't be classified <laughs> or at least very very little of it should be classified. We could proactively reach out to companies and startups, not just the big, the big, uh, you know, companies, but also the smaller ones doing great innovation in AI, AI ML, and convince them to come and help us and participate in this in this uh, uh, fight. They would proactively want to do that. I believe most people would want to do that. Uh, you, you also talk about innovation. You know, the fear of innovation. Well, you know, if it were not for for SpaceX. Today we'll be using Russian rockets to send our astronauts to the ISS. What kind of a disgrace is that, right? And the fact that people are even uh, willing to uh, be okay with this is mind-boggling to me. That that should never have been even acceptable. Um, and, and you see, you know, when SpaceX was created, you saw NASA, um, you know, um, uh, pretty much make fun of their concept of landing back rockets. Now, of course. That's the only way to do business. People are like, well, you know, that's uh, obvious now, right? Uh, but yet, you know, that was disrupting the status quo. You know, that's what Elon Musk has been doing. That's why Tesla, uh, you know, touched a, a trillion dollar valuation, right? And that's why I, I believe Elon Musk will be selling the first uh, trillionaire or whatever you, you say that. Mm -hmm. um, so. so ultimately, this is about leadership when we think about it and clarity and understanding. And I appreciate your uh, being outspoken and being a leader. Um, we need to hear this. Um, we can't put our head in the sand any longer, et cetera. Uh, so I want to thank you. Hopefully we can have this kind of conversation again. You, of course, sir, would be welcome back anytime. Uh, love for you to, to, uh, to uh, join us again, et cetera. And I just want to thank you for uh, being an out, outspoken advocate for our United States and its interests. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Nicholas deeply. I'll tell you what, you were great. You found yourself a new job. You can be the interviewer extraordinaire. <laughs> well, I have a little bit of passion about this, right? And it, I know you do. I know and, you do. Um, um, you know, um, he was above and beyond. He's above and beyond. Uh, he is the kind of person that can put his money where his mouth is. He has walk away money. He has mm -hmm. enough money. He can say, hey. you know, the problem is if job one is mm -hmm. keeping job one, mm -hmm. 
Remember Ford used to say job one was oh, quality, absolutely. right? Yeah, the right. quality is job one. Well, sometimes, depending on the role and the person, et cetera, sometimes and it, it can be that the job one is keeping job one and not taking risk and over-classifying things, not being willing to look outside of the DOD and, and, and things that are already classified, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, to take risk. Patton could be Patton during World War II because there was a calamity, because there was urgency. There Good was point. a threat. Good point, right, okay? right. Today, we feel complacent and we're safe and we're large, et cetera. And this is a sort of silent threat that we don't really see. Mm -hmm. When confronted with danger, someone like Patton who will do what needs to be done is value, right? Absolutely. But in a world today, like I said, well, we're America, we're fat and happy, et cetera. We're doing a good job. Yay, whatever. Yeah, they'll come down. No, it's happening now. Mm -hmm. And we need more patents. Yeah, I, I, I don't have the, the expertise or the knowledge that you've just shared with us all, but I'm right there with you. I totally, totally agree. Okay. Yeah, that, that was great. I really enjoyed visiting with Nicholas. Yeah, that was, that was very good. I really enjoyed that.